us as we center in and we focus in on who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, I pray that you'd open our heart to your word this morning. As Liz brings it forth, I pray, Lord, that you would be filled with your spirit as you would speak your words, Lord. I pray that you'd open our ears to hear your message, learn from you. We love you so much and we thank you. We thank you for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, welcome, ladies. So glad to be meeting with you this way over the internet to get into our study in the book of Colossians. I'm so excited about going through this book with all of you out there. Um, we certainly miss being together here in the church building, but the church goes on, and we need to be abiding in the word of God, especially during these times. So will you open your Bibles with me to the book of Colossians? I'm just going to pray that the Lord would anoint this message as we get into digging through this glorious book. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the the comfort of the scripture, the instruction, how it, it, it focuses our vision onto you, Lord, that you are the center, as our dear Lori led us in that song, that you would be the center of our lives, that you'd be the center of our thoughts, Lord. And so help us um, today as we study your book, that you, Lord, would just instruct us and show us a new way of looking at you, Lord, today, that you'd be magnified. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I said, I'm so excited to be starting this book with all of you, and um, as all scripture is so pertinent and relevant um, for all of us any day of the week, certainly at this time when we've been going through these difficult days, so unprecedented in our history, that we would really be abiding in God's word and that we would really be keeping our focus on that which the Lord would have us do. So this book of Colossians is very relevant to us. It was relevant to them when it was written by Paul to this little church in Colossae, and it's relevant for us today living in 2020. Just like us, the Colossian believers at that time lived in the midst of worldly and deceptive times. There were many voices. Does that sound familiar? This along with just day-to-day -day stresses and distresses made this these Christian brothers and sisters in this small town um, vulnerable to deceptive teachings and various doctrines that were trying to eke their way into the church and we're going to talk about those in the weeks to come a little bit today but we'll be kind of talking about what those false doctrines were but doesn't that sound familiar I mean we live in a time of many voices too and sometimes it's very confusing and it's hard to know what to focus on and what to really put our trust in, but we know the Word of God is where we can put our trust today. Now, Paul, with great love and concern, knowing that the Colossians were going through this, penned this beautiful letter, and it was to really take them to a place that they would hold fast to the centrality of Jesus Christ, his deity, his majesty, that he would once again redirect their hearts into the truth that Jesus was the foundation and source of their salvation. Jesus alone was the one who completes them, nothing else, no other doctrine or, or activity, but Jesus alone was the one who completes them and that he would be the fountain of all wisdom, comfort, and strength for these believers. The heart of Paul's desire for the Colossians could be found in Colossians 3.16, and I believe they'll put that up on the screen somewhere. I'm not sure where. I feel a little bit like Vanna White, you know, not, to, not sure where to point. But, um, but this is such a beautiful verse in the book of Colossians, and it kind of is a theme verse if you think about it. His heart for this church in Colossians 3.16, we read, let the, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I'm going to stop right there. We're just going to look at those first little few words there, but just let's take that apart. His heart for these believers, as God's heart is for us as believers, is that the word of Christ would dwell in us richly. Think of what that means, the word of Christ, the manifestation. The word is uh, what expresses the the substance of a thing, right? And that's why we know Jesus is the word of God. He is the expressed image of God. Well, that the word of Christ, all that he is, 
all that his personhood entails, all his desires for us would dwell, and I think of that word dwell, live, abide, sustain, be thoroughly in us in such a way that it would be saturating our lives richly. And again, that word richly, I think of that abundantly, thoroughly, that just like a sponge, when that sponge is squeezed, what comes out? Whatever the sponge is filled with, right? But if the, if the mind of Christ and the word of Christ is so richly abiding in us, then when troubles come and distresses and conflicting voices surround us and even shake us at times, we will think like Jesus wants us to think. We will respond as Jesus would have us respond. And it would be like him that we would reflect him because that is God's desire for each and every believer, that we would be conformed into the image of Christ. It's a lofty goal. It seems too big for me, but I know by the power of the Holy Spirit, these things can be done. So a little background on the Church of Colossae. Don't tune me out because sometimes these little history lessons could be a little boring, but I'm going to give it real, real short and sweet. But I do kind of want to give you an idea of what was, who, this, who these people were in Colossae. First of all, it was a small town, and it was 125 miles east of Ephesus. Now, all that really means is Ephesus was a booming town. It was a port city. It was right on the Asian Sea, sort of where the Mediterranean goes up in the Asian. If you've ever seen a map of Greece and Jerusalem and Israel down this way, it was kind of right up there in that northern area, which is modern-day Turkey, and they were inland Colossae. So they were actually on a trade route. So they weren't as big as Ephesus by any means, but they were certainly close enough where they were constantly in, in sort of business transactions with Ephesus. Then we had about 13 miles from them was Laodicea, and I know you've heard about that church, and we'll probably talk about them at some point as well. But they're in the area of modern-day Turkey. Um, who lived there? Well, it was mostly Greek people lived in um, Colossae, but there was a very large Jewish population as well, and many of them had come to Christ, both Jew and Greek, in the town. It was known for... Uh, like I said, trade. It was also known for its wools and its special um, purple dyes. So it was a place that people would visit. Now, the Church of Colossae was not founded by Paul directly. He was, it was founded by a convert of Paul's. Now, we know that Paul spent about three years in Ephesus. And during that time, a man named Epaphras, who we'll be reading about in just a moment, he had gone into Ephesus and probably had come to know the Lord through the ministry of Paul there. And then he traveled back to his hometown and he evangelized and a church was formed in Colossae. We believe that Epaphras was actually quite an evangelist and may have been the one who started the church in Laodicea as well. Then we also know from scripture, from the letter to Philemon, that Philemon was a rich man who lived in Colossae and hosted the church in Colossae, in his home, as well as his son, they believed, which his name was Archippus, was the pastor. So you'll see these names come up in Paul's letters where he addresses to these people that were involved with the church at Colossae. Paul himself never got a chance to actually visit the Colossians um, because this letter was written by him in a time when he was a prisoner in Rome, 59 to 64 AD. It seems that Epaphras at that time must have came to Paul and visited him in his house arrest in Rome. And probably to share, like I said, because Epaphras was the founding uh, father of that church in, Coloss in Colossae, he had concern for the Colossian believers. And he didn't come as a tattletale, but he probably came to Paul as a source of wisdom to understand and how to help the Colossians in their struggles. But he also, like a father, was kind of bragging on the church as well. So we'll see that as we open up, if you would, with me. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 14. So we start with, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, 
as it also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, for he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We're going to stop there and try to get to most of this today, but we want to start out with the fact that Paul just introduces himself as an apostle, a special messenger. That's what an apostle meant. And it's interesting because Paul was different than the other people that we think of as typically as apostles, which were the 12 that, fought, that Jesus called during his earthly ministry. And those 12 men walked with Jesus for three and a half years, they saw the Son of Man, they saw the Son of God, and they saw Jesus when he would sleep and when he would eat. So they had an understanding of the humanity of Christ, which is wonderful, and they were an eyewitness of his ministry for three and a half years. Paul had his encounter with Jesus, but it was a little different because he met the risen Christ, the glorified Christ. And if you remember, Paul was literally knocked off his horse by the risen Christ, right? Paul, Jesus... Um, came to him on that Damascus road, and in that very dramatic conversion, Paul went from being a um, actually a hater of the church, a murderer of the church, a persecutor of the church, to becoming one of his greatest evangelists and church planters and wrote a majority of the New Testament. That was a, a radical conversion. And so he went from being Saul to becoming the Apostle Paul. Paul referred with such lofty terms when he spoke of Jesus because he saw him in all his glory as the king of heaven, the creator of the heavens and the earth. The way Paul, you'll see in this letter, addresses and speaks of Jesus really harkens back to his Jewish roots, the way he saw the Lord in the, in the Old Testament as the creator God, the, the Lord of heaven and earth. And it also speaks of that personal testimony that he had in meeting the risen Christ. So Paul describes himself here as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was not an apostle unto himself or for any particular agenda, only to declare Jesus, only to make him known that he would be lifted up. It was the theme and the purpose of everything that Paul did. And he knew his calling was not bestowed on any earthly merit or anything he could have earned, but it was by the will of God. It was by the will of God. He says that right there in that first verse, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. You know, Paul was ordained, as one commentator wrote it, by the nail-pierced hands of Christ, and he never forgot it. In 1 Corinthians 15, I believe they're going to put that up on the thing there for you. I'll read it. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as a, by one born out of due time. And in verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles who am not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul remembered his roots. He was so grateful to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. He understood where he had come from. And I just, that's so encouraging to me because the glory is that whoever you are today, sister, you may be a single girl living in 2020 in the midst of this pandemic. You may be a student who's had to make a lot of changes, right? Learning how to um, learn online. You may be someone's daughter, you may be a mom, you may be a wife today, a teacher, a nurse, um, an engineer, a musician, a missionary. But what you are, you are by the will of God. And it gives a great purpose and meaning. And I love that all our calling is so different, so varied. There's no cookie cutters in the kingdom of God. God has such, um, I love that about our, our God, don't you, the creator God? Um, 
yesterday on, on social media, one of the sweet girls in our congregation had put pictures of these mosses that she collected on a hike that she had gone on. And she had put them in little bowls and she had them, I guess, on her windowsill or her kitchen counter. And just that picture she captured. And I was looking at that, I said, my goodness, those four or five different mosses look so different from each other. So out of curiosity, I looked it up, I Googled it. And you know that, there's, that there are over 10,000 types of mosses alone. That's amazing to me. That is our creator God, the variety. I mean, we're in the peak of spring here and each tree is more glorious than the next. We've been walking our neighborhood and Grace and I will say, which one's our favorite for tonight? You know, it's the white one, it's the pink one. Oh no, that one's different. Oh, look at the cluster. He is a God of great variety, such a variety. Just the birds, the amount of birds and uh, million, uh, what is it, 18,000 species of different types of birds. I mean. Just God does not do things just cookie cutter. He has a specific call for each of his created beings. And, 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 and I think of that in terms of our humanity. You know, we're so good at making little boxes, aren't we? Oh, are you Caucasian? Are you African-American? Are you Latin? Are you, oh, check off the box. That's what you are. Well, you're more than that, aren't you? We're all more than that. God, we, God blows those boxes off. He, he has made us so varied and so specific and so beautifully. It says we are fearfully and wonderfully made by the Lord. And so is the call in our lives. And I hope you know that today. In this way, he addresses his audience now. He defines who he is. He, he knows who he is, that he's, he's an apostle called by God. But then at the same time, he, he addresses his audience. He calls them the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae in verse 2. Saints. That word saints, if you're not familiar too much with the scripture, you might think, well, I guess I know what a saint is, but don't you have to be canonized to be a saint? I know sometimes when Bobby has referred from the pulpit to the congregation, says, hey, saints, turn your Bibles, or hey, saints, and people say, really, am I a saint? Well, you are. If you believe in Jesus and you put your trust in him and you've given your life to him, you are a saint because saint means set apart. And every believer should know that they are set apart from this world onto Jesus. That's what a saint is. And if that defines you today because you have trusted in Christ, that's who you are. What a saint is not is someone that can intercede for you to the Father or has a special pathway. No only one mediator to the Father. In 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, For there is one God and only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Let's be clear on that. Um, they're not, a saint is not someone to be prayed to. We as saints can pray together, of course, and pray for each other, but we're never to be prayed to. And so, a saint is a wonderful um, title to call any believer, and Paul uses it here for the believers in Colossae. He also calls them faithful brethren, and that's such a gift, isn't it, to be part of the sisterhood and the brotherhood of Christ, that we are part of the family of God. I have three daughters, and I just they are so different from one another, even though they've been raised by the same two parents, but they each have their own way of looking at life and 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 just different tastes and all of that. And sometimes they can get into squabbles and disagree with this one's opinion or that one's opinion. But what I love is one minute they'll be kind of squabbling and the next minute I hear them all dying laughing over a common joke. Because that's the way sisters are, right? We can, we're easy to forgive. We're hopefully, we're quick to forgive. Well, that's the way God wants us in the body of Christ. We need each other. We need to have each other's back. We're blood through the blood of Jesus. But more importantly, I love in this introduction of who these people were. Yes, they were faithful brethren. Yes, they were saints, called out ones. But he mentions here that they are in Christ and they are in Colossae. This is really interesting, these two little prepositional phrases. In Colossae, that's where they lived. It wasn't maybe the best circumstances, because like I said, there were some distressing things happening and there was some um, turmoil even in the church with different doctrines that were coming in. It was temporal, it was changing, but one thing that was not changing was they were in Christ, and that's eternal. That's an eternal standing, and that is true for us today. What is our in Colossae? Where do we find ourselves today? Is it in this quarantine, Ugh, in this pandemic? Is it that you're in the thick of battle? You're a nurse, you're on the front lines, you're a doctor, an emergency worker, a grocery store clerk, 
you're out there. There's no quarantining for you. You're getting out to work every day and doing what you can. Maybe that's a little frightening. Maybe you're in a homeschool that you never asked for. <laughs> you did not get the homeschooling catalogs and decide to homeschool. It was thrust upon you. And maybe you feel like you're sinking. Maybe you're a little bit in debt right now or having some real financial strains because of this. Maybe you just feel like you're a mess. You're not going through it very well. Well, let me tell you something. That may be true. And there are circumstances in our life. But they're going to change. And they're not the end of the story. You might say to me, Liz, I just feel like I'm messing up and I can't seem to get it right. You may feel dry. You may feel like the mean mommy today, like, oh my goodness, I've been so impatient with my children. You may feel like that frumpy wife <laughs> that's been sweatpants a little too long. Maybe you just even feel a little vulnerable, like a little afraid. That may be your in Colossae, but don't you forget that you're in Christ, that you're in Christ. And that will never change. That's an eternal position. Because we are in Christ today, we are robed in his righteousness. I love that. That means that even when I feel like I feel like the prodigal coming back from the pigsty and I still kind of stink, I'm still robed in his righteousness. I thank God that the Bible tells me because I'm in Christ. I'm accepted in the beloved. Maybe our recipes aren't accepted by Pinterest, or maybe we don't feel like our clothes and our figure would be accepted by Glamour or Vogue, or maybe we just don't feel our home decor would necessarily be accepted by Chip and Joanna, <laughs> but we are accepted in the beloved today. He loves us so much, and in verse 13, it talks about that we've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness, and we are now part of that kingdom of light. So, Let's remember today, no matter what your Colossae is looking, for, look, looking like right now, just remember that we're in Christ. We have an eternal position in him. And you, that is not going to change. And he is doing a work in you. And he has a purpose for you and me. And he's not done yet. Isn't that good to know? He's not done yet. The period hasn't been put on that end of that paragraph. He's still working on us. So... Paul goes on to tell us now that he is always praying for this church. What a gift to give to each other, to be prayerful. His prayer life was very important to Paul. In fact, he was in prison and he used that time. He might not have been able to travel, but he was able to go by prayer into all these different areas and pray for the believers. And he starts his prayer with thanksgiving for them. And I love that. It says there, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. We should start our prayers with thanks as well. And he was thankful for very specific things that he had heard from Epaphras about these believers. Let's see what he writes. In verse 4, like I said, he says, we have praying always for you in verse 3. And he says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Let's stop there for a moment. The first thing he mentions that he heard about from Epaphras about these believers is that they had faith in Christ Jesus. We're going to see three things mentioned here in faith, hope, and love. Faith, love, and hope in this particular um, sequence. But faith is usually always the first because apart from faith, there is no Christian experience. We must believe. And it can't just be a nebulous belief like, oh, yeah, I believe. I'm, I'm a person of faith. Faith in what? That's, that's what counts. Faith in who? Is it just faith in faith? No, it must be faith in Jesus Christ. He's the object of our faith. It's on him. And that word faith, just a really, for me, this has always helped me because that can be sort of one of those terms, like what does faith look like? Faith is a leaning, your full weight on something. It's like putting faith in a chair, right? You go to sit down, you put your full weight, you're, you have faith that that chair is going to hold you up. That kind of faith is fully leaning on Jesus. I'm putting my all, all my trust, all my confidence is on him. That's what we're talking about. And Epaphras had said, this group of believers, they have faith in Jesus Christ. The next thing he mentioned to Paul, and Paul reports, is that they had love for all the saints. And that's an important thing, because if we have faith, it only makes sense, scripturally, that there will be love. In Galatians 5, 6, it says, I'm going to pull it up here. I'm I think they're going to have it on, on there for you as well. Galatians 5, 6, it says, For in Christ there's neither circumcision nor, any, nor uncircumcision, 
avails anything but faith working through love. In John 13, 35, you know this verse, Jesus himself told his disciples, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We're not going to put it up, but 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now abide faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. If we have faith, sisters, we must be loving. It, must, it, it expresses itself through love. You know, I was thinking about that. Sometimes love precedes faith in a sense because we first understand the love of God for us when we see it displayed in Jesus on the cross at Calvary. And because we are just wooed by that love of God, we put our trust and faith in him. But then we become a conduit of that love and we are to love others. The Bible's full of it. First John saying, if you say you don't love, then you really don't know God because God is love. So we must love. Some people think, well, what does it matter what I believe as long as I'm nice, as long as I do things nice? Maybe someone who doesn't believe in Christ might say that. Well, I can do good things. I can do loving things. What does it matter if I believe? But let me tell you, for any kind of sustained goodness, you must have a motivation of love. And that love, that eternal love from God, is going to change what you do and why you do it and how you do it. Are you doing it for a thanks, for pride reasons? But when you love God and you're doing it for the love of God, you don't mind if anybody knows this as long as you're doing it to, to show your love for God. And then he also mentions that they have this hope of heaven. That's mentioned there. Paul mentions that the Colossians have this great hope, and they knew about it right from the beginning of their salvation experience, that they had heard of this hope of heaven. And thank God we have the hope of heaven as well. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel in verse 5. What a wonderful thing that our salvation experience it starts today and we're set free from sin and guilt. We're given new life in Christ. We're given joy. We're given peace. But we also have that wonderful hope of the eternal heavens. I remember seeing uh, Pastor Francis Chan. He did a thing where he had this rope on a stage. And this was one of those big nautical ropes. And it was piled high in coils and coils and coils of this rope. And it went across the whole stage. And he stood on the end of the, end of the stage. And just at the little tip of the rope was painted red. And he explained, this is your life here on earth. This is your eternal life. And how much we spend so much time fretting over that little red part and what's going to happen to us when, meanwhile, all of eternity waits for us. That's our hope of heaven. I hope you have that hope today. So Epaphras had reported this to Paul. I picture him going, let me tell you what's going on in Colossae. They've got faith. They've got love. They've got hope. Well, how did he know that? Was that just like platitudes? Was that just sort of him making up some stuff? No, I believe that he knew this to be true of the Colossians because it could be observed. It could be observed because it says in verse 6, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it also has among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. There was fruit to be observed. And that's an important part because the Bible talks about that we will be known by our fruits. So when Epaphras said this, he had reason to say it. He had seen the fruit of this in the lives of those believers. There was visible signs. You know, fruit is a visible sign of the health of a tree. And the Bible speaks of spiritual fruit. In fact, Galatians, we've been doing a study since the fall, and you can access that on our website or our um, app. And we've been taking those fruit that I've mentioned in Galatians 5, and we've been going through them one by one. Galatians 5, 2, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, oh, that was a good one. Sally taught that one. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the wonderful fruit of the Holy Spirit, and they can be seen. They look like something. I would encourage you to listen to some of those me messages. They're more than just words. They look like something in the life of a believer, and I believe the Colossians exhibited those fruits, and that's why Epaphras could say, oh, they have faith, they have love, they have hope. Um, as well as the spiritual fruit of soul winning. The church was growing. People were coming to know Christ. This is another aspect of spiritual fruit where there's evangelism. So like I said, Paul states this petition and he, he gives thanks at first as part of his prayer. 
But then he's going to move into what he's praying specifically for these believers. And we're going to get to that. But I want to say, this is really interesting. This was from um, a commentary by Phillips. And I thought this was really interesting what he said. He said, note, Paul did not pray to get out of prison or to be saved from execution. He did not pray, at least in his recorded prayers, for financial support or about his chronic ill health. He did not pray for people that God would prosper them in business or heal their ailments or forward their secular and material interests of their children or even save their relatives. Doubtless, there were times when he prayed for such things, but these things were reserved for his private prayers. We find them conspicuously absent from his public and recorded prayers. When Paul prayed for believers, he prayed for spiritual things. He didn't get caught up in a lot of the material things or that things would just be easier for them. No, he prayed for spiritual growth in believers. And I think that's really important. So as we go through the things he's asking for, think about this as a prayer for yourself or someone you can pray these things for, your children, your um, neighbors, your spouse. Um, these are wonderful things that we can be praying for each other. So the first thing Paul prays for. He says, we do, we, we do not cease to pray um, uh, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray for you, in verse 9, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So that's the first thing. He asks for spiritual vision for these believers, that they would have a knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Think about that knowledge, that they would know the word of God, that they would know it. You, know, you can't know it if you don't read it. You can't know it if you're not being taught it you, and sitting under teaching. We are to know the word of God. We are to becoming more familiar with the word of God. That is a prayer that we can pray for ourselves, that we have a desire to do that. Some people say, I don't, sometimes I don't really even have the desire to read the Bible. I remember hearing that years ago. I'm kind of feeling it myself. And I remember someone saying, just pray to God to give you a hunger for it. Ask him to give you a hunger to be hungry. <laughs> and we can ask that. Another thing, wisdom. Now it's not just knowing the word of God, it's applying the word of God. That's what wisdom is. Do you not apply the word of God? This talks about wisdom and obedience, that we would do what God's word says. And then finally, discernment, which is spiritual understanding, being discriminating and discerning to understand what the truth is and how to discriminate when falsehoods come our way. So he prays this, and it's very specific for this church because they were dealing with this um, false doctrine called Gnosticism. And what Gnosticism was, these Gnostics were coming in and saying, oh, yes, you have Jesus, but you need other special wisdom that we have. And we can impart to you. Oh, don't worry about the word. Um, we're going to give you these special little insights. And so it became a hierarchy, and God hates hierarchies. He does not like that in the church. And so... Paul is saying, you need wisdom, you need knowledge, but you need the knowledge of God. It's not a special human wisdom or anything else. In Psalm 1, verses 1 through 2, it says, Blessed is the man or woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his or her delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law she meditates day and night. That's where we're talking about. And, and Joshua 1.8, um, I believe they'll put that up. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. This is where our spiritual vision comes from. This is what Paul is praying about, that they'd be saturated in the word of God. They'd know the word of God. They'd apply the word of God, obey the word of God, have discernment and have spiritual vision. The next thing he prays for them in verse 10 is that they may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. He, this now speaks of spiritual vitality, that they would have a vital walk with God, that they would walk worthy of the Lord. A walk is something people can observe. It's an outward life that others see. The word walk here is in a particular tense in the, uh, in the Greek, which talks about set out walking. Maybe you didn't walk so great yesterday, and you're like, yikes, I don't know if I'm walking worthy of the Lord. Well, that word walk is like, start a new walk. Start today. Start out fresh again today. Walk worthy of him. 
one of my favorite authors, um, Dr. Helen Rosevere, she was a missionary in the Congo. Some of you girls know I've talked to her before. She went through great heartache and suffering. Uh, she was a surgeon who went to the Congo, started hospitals and nursing programs and orphanages, and she suffered great loss. She was beaten, she was brutally raped. She went through, a, uh, during the time of the revolution, was very mistreated. And at the end of her time there, after 10 or 15 years in the Congo, she looked around at the buildings and the different um, graduates they had from their nursing and surgical schools and whatnot, and the converts. And, and there certainly were plenty, plenty done. But after so much sacrifice, she kind of had some soul searching and she thought, was it worth it? All the sacrifice, not having a life of her own really to speak of, poured out. And then she said, of course it was worth it because he is worthy. It's worth it because he is worthy. That's the kind of walk we're talking about, that we would fully please him. That speaks of meeting all his wishes and desires, that he's our good shepherd and we know his voice. And when he calls to us, like sheep, we go to our good shepherd. It also speaks of our walk being fruitful in every good work. It says that right there in that verse, that we'd be fruitful in every good work. When we abide in him, we're going to have fruit and it's gonna be fruits of good works. In fact, when Peter described Jesus to Cornelius in Acts 10, he said, Jesus is one who went about doing good. And if we're his followers, we should also be people who go about doing good. And then finally in that verse, it says that they continue to increase in the knowledge of God, this epic gnosis, this intimate knowledge of God. And I love that because it started out with knowing and then it built on the idea of obedience and walking. And what does it eventually circle back to? Knowing him more, knowing him more, knowing him more. Years ago, I remember teaching the kids at a Saxon map. You homeschoolers out there are familiar with that curriculum. And they often said that he, it had a helix type of teaching pattern. You'd start out, you'd go, the next one you'd go back a little, you'd go back a little, you review, you go back a little, you add new concepts. It was a constant loop, but you were making progress. I like what one commentator said, this kind of growing in Christ from spiritual knowledge, to wisdom, to understanding, to being fruitful in every good work, walking worthy of him, it's like an upward helix, constant going back up, knowing him more. To me, it's, it seems like we're just getting back to that garden, aren't we? That garden where Adam would walk with God in such intimate knowledge. And that's what God wants for us, to get back to that garden experience where we just know him so well. And then thirdly, Paul prayed for them, first with spiritual vision, if you remember, spiritual vitality, and now for spiritual victory. Because in verse 11, he said that you be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, to be strengthened with all might. This word is exciting because it's dunamis, power from God, that we might be strengthened with the might that only comes from the Lord. Girls, my friends, sisters, we cannot live off other people's strength. We can't live off our husband's strength. My husband has great faith, and sometimes I, oh, excuse me, um, sometimes I do feel like, oh, I wish I just could have his faith. Listen, we're responsible for God to be growing in strength, not of our own, but to be drawing from the Lord. He wants to give us his strength, that we would draw from the power of God by the Holy Spirit. You can't live on someone else's, your parent, your mom, your dad, your Sunday school teacher, your pastor. We have to have a direct line that we'd be growing in power from him. And what's this power for? Just to walk around like superheroes? No. If it, you know it's that verse, it says that we would be filled and strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, because that's a, that's a huge reserve of power he can share with us. For what, for what reason? For all patience and long suffering with joy. This power is gonna give us the ability to stand in patience, and that word patience there is endurance for difficult circumstances. Do you need that today? I need that today. The Colossians needed that. That's a great prayer. <laughs> That's a great prayer to be praying. And that word steadfast or endurance, it's a military term. It's like in Ephesians 6 when it talks about standing, that when we've done all, when we've put our armor on, that we'll stand in the day of battle. 
that's what God wants to strengthen us to do, to stand for him in difficult circumstances. And then the second part of that is long-suffering. And that has to do with dealing with difficult people. God wants us to have both of those things, endurance, patience for difficult circumstances, long-suffering, dealing with difficult people. How? With joy. <laughs> oh, that God would do that work in us. Jesus being our supreme example. I think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What difficult circumstances, what endurance to pray and to, to wrestle in prayer about the cross ahead of him and the separation from the Father and taking the sins of the world onto his spotless, sinless self. And yet he received that power to endure those circumstances. But also Jesus had to deal with long suffering with people that just didn't get it. His disciples who wouldn't even watch an hour with him. For those that would betray him. For those that would crucify him, do the actual act of crucifying him with the nails and the scourgings. And he did it with joy. He, he prayed for his, his oppressors. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And the Bible tells us for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He is our example, that that's the kind of power God wants to impart to us, that we might walk through these things with joy and have patience and long-suffering. So at the end here, Paul again thanks God. He's such a thankful person. I pray that we are thankful people. I hope that your prayers are seasoned with lots of thanks. And if you're in the Word, it's real easy to find things to thank God for, because right here in verse 12, he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. And finally in 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. What wonderful things to thank God for. That right there gives you a list right there. Thanking him for that he has delivered us. Thanking him that he has redeemed us. He has brought us back from the curse. He has washed us clean. He's removed shame. He's removed guilt. Do you know that today? That his blood does that for you? That your name is newly written in the Lamb's Book of Life? I love that Paul thanked God for these things as it concerned the Colossian believers. They were not perfect. They were struggling. They were having some problems in the church. We'll get into those as we go on. There were some questioning, some doubts, maybe some crisis of faith. Maybe that's us today. But do you know what? We're still his saints. We're still in Christ. And those truths that he has qualified us to be partakers of this glorious kingdom. And whose kingdom is it? It's Jesus' kingdom, and God, the Father, loves his Son, and he lets us to be joint heirs, lets us be joint heirs with Christ in that kingdom. We're going to end there, girls. What a glorious way to end. I hope that today we are going to be thanking God for our salvation, our deliverance. Let's pray this prayer, this model prayer, for spiritual vision and spiritual vitality and spiritual victory in our life and in the life of those we love. We all need it. We all need to be strengthened in these ways, don't we? I know I do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And God, I just ask, Lord, that you would fill us with spiritual knowledge and wisdom and understanding, God, that we might walk worthy of you, Lord, in this day, in this age, Lord, that we would please you, that we would be fruitful, that we would be fruitful and bearing fruit in every good work, Lord that you would strengthen us according to your glorious might, O oh God, that we might have patient endurance, Lord, for times where we need to take our stand for you, Jesus, that we might be long-suffering and kind and, and willing to wait and be sensitive to the needs and, and, and those around us that might, we might find difficult sometimes to deal with, but that you would give us your love and that you would give us your joy in all of it, God that we might do it joyfully, not begrudgingly, not with a bad attitude, but that we'd be filled with your joy. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this um, book. We thank you that it's relevant. We thank you that your word is alive and active, God, and it's exactly what we need for today. And we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you girls. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.